Hi, I'm Joe Mecca with Coastal Federal Credit Union, and we have a guest here today. It's Clark Howard, the one of the leading national uh, consumer experts. He is the host of the aptly named Clark Howard Show, which is nationally syndicated. It airs locally on WPTF uh, 850 AM. Um, Clark is actually in Raleigh today promoting his new book, Living, long, living Large for the Long Haul. Um, Clark, you've been to Raleigh a few times. Welcome back. I have. Thank you. Many times. Although the weather here is usually better than it is this moment. This moment, yes. Yes, it's unseasonably uh, Seattle. Yes, it, it, that's a perfect analogy. But it's an area that has a lot of blue sky and a special blue, right? It's very, very yeah. special blue. Yeah. yeah. Very special blue. So, uh, so Clark, you've been, to, you've been to Raleigh a few times. Uh, you've been a good friend of the credit union. Uh, this time in particular, you're in town promoting your book. So you want to tell us yeah, a little, this little one, bit about this one? Well, this one's my 10th book. 10th book. Wow. Yeah, and uh, the last one was Living Large and Lean Times. It came out during the depths of the despair that people had about the economy and was a how-to guide. I, I had it divided, things you could do in the next 30 days for your wallet, things you could do in the next year, and things over the course of your lifetime that would allow you to control your wallet instead of it controlling you. This book, even though it shares a similar title, is completely a different kind of thrust. This is stories of 50 individuals and families from across America that in some way got crushed over these last six years during the Great Recession and how they're finding their way back out. And some of the stories are amazing of people who, who have taken the lemons that the economy gave them the last few years and they're way past lemonade and what they've been able to turn it into. And then others who are muddling through and because not everything wraps up with a nice tidy bow but every profile of every individual or family from across America, I end the profile with tips that personalize it to what you can do in your life. And it's different because I felt from talking to people all across this great land of ours, there was an underlying sense of pessimism in people about maybe their own future, or particularly the country's future. And I wanted my viewers, my listeners, my readers to know that we're not done at all in America. That there's been a tough, sad chapter, but we got a lot of good stuff in front of us, and that's what this book is about: is that bright future. Very good, very good. Um, and through your radio show and your different book tours, um, you talk to a lot of consumers, a lot of a lot of people do. with a variety of, of concerns. What has people most excited or most concerned right around this this point in time? Well, excited are people who have come up with a new way to handle their lives, either financially or on the employment side. And so there are a lot of people who met with adversity, found a new path that's been great. I also hear from a lot of people who are still stuck. You know, they're underemployed right now. They may be unemployed, more often underemployed than unemployed. And they don't know the way out. They don't know what to do next, where to go. And a lot of what I've been about the last at least two and a half years is talking to people who really feel dead-ended, who feel trapped, and how to get them out of that dead end and get them moving again. And it's not the same answer for everybody. You know, different circumstances, different backgrounds, ages, experience, education leads to maybe a different path for people. But there, there's things any of us can do if we get the right motivation and the right idea to get out of that bind we feel like we're in. Very good. Very good. Um, there are a lot of different things that people try and try to do to get themselves financially on the right track to save money, to maybe spend a little bit less. Right. Um, what, are, what, what are some of the misconceptions? Something that people think they're doing right and actually isn't helping them all or, or maybe okay. hurting them. This is funny because this one has been very common these last six years in particular is people aren't carrying as much credit card debt as they used to carry. And that's been a very clear trend. That's a healthy trend. But what people do is when they have a credit card balance they had, and they eventually pay it off, they make the mistake of closing the account. You do not want to close an account as like a graduation gift. Because when you do that, instead of helping your credit score, you hurt your credit score. 
because you reduce the amount of available credit you have, you reduce the number of active items in your credit mix and credit score. And so I try to uh, get people, if they're worried that they still have that account open, they'll use it to use my freezer bag method. Do you know that? I, I do know that. I do know that. Yeah, so for people who don't know what you do, you take a freezer bag, put the cards in it that you don't want to use anymore, put water in there, seal it, throw it in the freezer. And then by the time you have an impulse to spend, well, hopefully it's passed by the time the cards would thaw out. I did have one person call me, though, who actually took their cards and put them in the microwave to try to thaw them quicker. And they ended up with something that looked like bacon, but not as tasty as bacon. <laughs> not as tasty as bacon. Yeah. Not as tasty as bacon. Um, that's actually a good, a good tip, good trick. Um, what, what's actually the strangest money-saving tip you've heard from consumers? I know you've given a lot of advice, but... Okay, well, I've got one in the book. A couple that lives in how they refer to it is downstate Illinois. They live in rural Illinois. And this couple had almost $100,000 in student loan debt. And they realized that they would spend their entire working lives in debt. That they had no path to be able to pay it off. And try to imagine this in an area with no public transit. They sold both of their cars. They get around everywhere by bicycle. And in four years' time, what they save on automobiles, they wiped out their entire student loan debt. Wow, that's People don't that's realize amazing. that cars cost a zillion dollars. Cars are expensive. I mean, I mean they're like, uh, you know, they're always referred to as the second most expensive thing in people's lives. But there are circumstances with people who like new wheels all the time. It costs them more than their housing. You know, when you go all in on all the costs involved with an automobile. So this couple, I really like pointing them out because they went so far to an extreme. But here's the great thing. They've now paid off all that debt. They're fit as could be now. Right. And even in Illinois winters, they still haven't bought a car. Amazing. And so now they're like max savers because all that money they were putting into the student loan debt they're now building up enormous reserves of money, and it's pretty extreme to me. Can you imagine in this metro area saying, "You know, I'm just not going to have a car." It would, it would be, be very difficult. It would be very, especially very hard. Market, especially so, here. so you say, especially here in Raleigh, but the reality is, it's even tougher in downstate Illinois. Yes. And, Fair point. And they did this. And think of what their winters are like with all the snow and all that. And I've got pictures of them on ClarkHoward.com where they're, they're all bundled up riding their bikes in the snow. I mean, it's, it's crazy, it's but crazy like a fox. Eh? That's good. That's good. Um, that's actually interesting. You talk about uh, taking a look at where all their expenses are going. Um, one of our employees had actually submitted a question. I said, yeah, I know I, know I need to budget. And I know I need to tell my members how to budget. But a lot of people know this, still don't put that in practice. So, mm -hmm. so quick beginner tips, advice yeah. for someone just trying to get established. Okay. So a lot of people, uh, it's like the thing, like they know they should go to the gym and work out. And they even guilt themselves about it. But they don't go to the gym to work out. It's a very hard thing first to do and then to stick with. So... I like Met.com. I don't know if you ever tried Met.com. It's both a website and an app mm -hmm. that you can use to really track where all your spending goes. It's kind of like, I don't know if you've ever heard of this diet technique, but if people have trouble consuming too many calories, there's some behavioral psychologist who says you put a mirror up one foot from your face while you eat and you watch yourself eat. Oh, wow. And apparently, none of us really look that attractive eating. And it helps reduce your consumption of food when you're actually watching yourself eat. Well, the idea with mint is, there it is, smacking you right in the face. Yeah. You spent this here, you spent that there, over there. And it, and it kind of acts like a nag and a coach and a guide you know, try, through trying to get you to get your spending under control. But there's another slice of people that will help. But if you really can't get it under control, I have the magic answer, okay? What's that? All right, I'll have to show you. 
It's a very high tech answer to how you get your spending under so control. Carver just took out his wallet, which if you listen, he doesn't do that often. Okay, so this thing, kind of smelly dollar bill. Anyway, so- Money is smelly. Yeah, so, but this, when you hear this, this is smelly in a good way. When I find an individual or a couple, and it's more often with a couple, that they can't get their spending under control, and it starts to tear at the fabric of their marriage, and they each blame the other for the spending patterns, I find there's one shock therapy that absolutely works, and it's this. That if they put away the credit card, the debit card, that they go cash only. And what I recommend is that on payday, you've agreed as a couple how much cash you're going to live on till the next payday. And all your walking around spending is done with cash. The beauty of it is that let's say somebody gets paid every 14 days. Maybe about day 10, you don't have money to go out and eat lunch. So then you're looking in your, your refrigerator and maybe you're going to learn that that day you really like a bologna sandwich. That the cash, the difference with the plastic, the problem with the plastic is that you don't get the sense that money is finite. You don't get the sense that the supply shrinks. But if you take out a certain amount of cash on payday and that cash has to last, so the next pay period, mm -hmm. you'd be amazed what it does. There was a couple from Tennessee that in my TV work, I did, for lack of a better term, I did an intervention. This couple, they both made good incomes. She was a registered nurse. I don't remember what he did. And their marriage was shredding. They were, they were coming apart at the seams because they were always in debt, they were having trouble even making minimums on their credit cards, and I got them on the shock therapy of an allowance, and I got the sweetest, nicest letter from her about a year and a half later about how the cash allowance had worked, they had gotten their spending under control, their marriage had gotten back on a nice track, and you know, people think that couples have their marriages disintegrate over things in the bedroom, but more often Money's it's the about one the money. Thing. Money is the number one reason. And they have more trouble talking about money than they do stuff in the bedroom. So that's why I find over and over again that cash is king when you can't get the discipline. Very good. Very good. Sorry that was such a long no. answer, but I think it's a, that it's a thorough answer. for so many people, I think it's really important. If you're watching this and you felt out of control, you need to know the powers in you to get it under control. As long as you have a job. You don't have a job, different story. But if you're working, you got the power. Very good. Very good. Um, I know you hear a lot from a lot of consumers who we hear from. Um, so be a little selfish this time. What advice would you give to credit unions? Put on your, your credit union manager hat. Um, what would you do if you were running a credit union to, to really help put people on the right direction financially? What would you advise that we do? Well, one thing for a credit union is because it's a co-op and the whole purpose is by and for the members mm -hmm. is that you have the flexibility of offering people more generous terms as savers. Mm -hmm. And I always refer to it as there are savers credit unions and there are borrowers credit unions. And I love it when a credit union has that savers mentality where, where there's direct incentives to get people started. And I think automatic programs where you have, uh, where every pay period, a certain amount automatically goes into a savings account or even multiple purpose accounts where a Christmas fund or a vacation fund or uh, you know a, a emergency rainy day account that doing everything you can to message to people the value and power that comes from saving I think is one of the greatest things a credit union can do. Well Clark I know we have to uh, get you on the air but it's always good to have you in Raleigh. Thank you. Thank you for having me here and you know I've been a believer, I should say, I've been a believer in credit unions for as far back as I can remember before I knew what a credit union was. And if you don't mind, I'll take a second and sure. explain that. 
I was a civilian employee of the Air Force during the Vietnam War, and I worked in the Pentagon. And I was telling one of the officers about this terrible problem I was having with the bank I had my account at. And he said, well, you should go to my bank. And I said, what's that? He says, the one downstairs, I'll take you there. And so he takes me downstairs one day, and it's Pentagon Federal Credit Union. Mm -hmm. And I didn't even know what a credit union was at 19 years old. And so I opened the account there, and I was so glad I did. And I got the experience about what it's like to have an account at a place where you're an owner, you're a member, it's your place. It's a completely different feel than being at a bank where it's the stockholder's place and they're just allowing you to put your money there. Exactly. So that's why credit unions mean so much to me. And I should point out, um, not all credit unions are created equal. There are so many credit unions now of all shapes and sizes and some are very member driven Others not doing as good a job at that as they can, or as they should. So you've got to make sure that the credit union you join really has its ear attuned to serving the member. Absolutely. Thanks again, Clark. Thank you for having Thanks. me. Thanks.